This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Six Hour. My guest today is Douglas London. Douglas is the author of The Recruiter, Spying, and the Lost Art of American Intelligence. He spent 34 years at the Central Intelligence Agency. And for those doing the math, that is 17 years on either side of 9-11. So we got to see the agency before and see a cultural shift after 9-11 that continues today. Before that, he was a Marine. And the book is incredible. Our conversation was, uh, was amazing. So I hope you enjoy it. And off air, he described this book as a love letter to espionage. And I think that is quite fitting, but it's also a book about accountability. Now, without further ado, Douglas London. All right. So I wrote a little something I want to start with and then, uh, and then jump into a few, uh, few questions for you. But um, so I think this book's important, not only because it inspires the next generation, but without books like these, these government institutions that all too often hide behind protecting sources and methods, sometimes legitimately, sometimes not, but highlights the importance of accountability and of learning from the lessons of the past, especially in instances where CIA officers and recruited agents have given the ultimate sacrifice. So as in the military, what we owe those people who gave that sacrifice and their families is to learn from those lessons and then apply them going forward as wisdom. And we don't usually do a very good job of that, at least in this, uh, this modern era, uh, particularly from the end of World War II on, or maybe the end of Korea on. But, uh, but you came to the CIA in 1984. Yeah. I mean, wow. Yeah. That, <laughs> it's a couple moons back, yeah. but, uh, and then you did 34 years. And yeah. Before that, you were in the Marines, 1981, a radio operator. I was a radio uh, And that's how I came in too. I remember my MOS even. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I was a, a radio guy, uh, comms guy. We called them in my uh, my first SEAL platoon, first and second SEAL platoons. Um, and you served under six Republican and four Democrat administrations. And for those who are doing the math, it's 17 years on either side of 9-11. Yeah, very symmetrical. Wow. So that gives you a very unique perspective, having so much time on either side of that very pivotal date, obviously, in the history of the nation and the world. But uh, what was your path to the to the CIA? At what point did you start uh, becoming interested in intelligence services and, and the Marine Corps before that? Or how did that all, all transpire without uh, without the internet? How did you learn anything in, uh, in 1981, 1984? Uh, and I think you had a mentor that helped you along the way there. Yeah, very, that, absolutely true. In fact, it's uh, it's always awkward trying to explain that to my students. I teach a, a grad, couple of graduate courses and it's on intelligence and security. And to, to try to explain to them what life was like prior to the internet or cell phones, it's, it's almost like you know going back to the Civil War for us maybe. But um, <laughs> the, the Marine thing was an easy answer. My dad was a Marine. He was a Korean War era Marine and he had passed when I was pretty young. So it was always something that I was important to our whole family and certainly important to me. And uh, though I do remember, you know, I, I, I was 15 when my dad passed. I was even talking to him back then about the Marine Corps. And he was saying, well, you know, you know, Marine Corps is great. And, and I have nothing but pride for it, even though he's badly wounded during the war. Uh, and he said, but, you know, I really want to make sure you get your education, you know, go to college. Then if you want to join the Marines, join the Marines, but please get your degree first, because my dad didn't even graduate from high school and, and signed up when he was 17, maybe, wow. for the war. So um, I got to college, and unfortunately, I was not uh, an overachiever. And, um, <laughs> and so the Marine Corps seemed like a good thing to do. So I remember talking to my family about it, and uh, they you know, were a little concerned because I was going to have to leave school. And they said, well, I'll do this at least, you know, sign up for the reserves. Because if you sign up for the reserves, that's like six months. And then you could always decide whether you want to go permanent active duty or just, you know, fulfill your reserve obligation with your active duty drills and, and summer active duty and such like that. So I took their advice, which was probably best for the Marine Corps and myself. <laughs> uh, because as much as I do love uh, having been a Marine and once a Marine, always a Marine, you know, um, it was probably not the best fit because I was a bit... Uh, not enough of a, of a conformist, I suppose, and a little bit too independent. And uh, I still take great pride. And in fact, my two sons, one joined the Navy, and he's still a serving Naval officer. He's a surface warfare officer. And my other son joined the Marines, uh, but after the Naval Academy, went to the Naval Academy and then went Marine. 
And he only just got out a couple of years ago after, you know, you know, making my life challenging by spending a couple of tours in Afghanistan and making yeah. more that night. Yeah. But, uh, but that was my road to the Marine Corps. Uh, and um, I actually was going to go back into the Corps after I graduated and take a commission because they had been encouraging me, the Marines had, to take a commission. In fact, they offered me the Naval, the um, enlisted commissioning program, some other things. But at that time, anyway, in the 80s, it was like a 10-year commitment. It was four years of school and then six years um, in the Marine Corps. So I felt that like at 19, I didn't want to you know, sign up for nine, you know, 10 years. So uh, I applied to, I never really applied to the agency, so to speak, because back then there really was no way to apply. I mean, you could write, I suppose, but I did have a mentor. I had a professor and he was a career foreign service officer. He's most erudite, articulate. I mean, he's like, you know, in the dictionary, diplomat, and there would be a picture of him. Yeah. Tall, blooming voice. And uh, he was career foreign service and rose to be an ambassador a couple of times. And after taking of his classes, I thought, you know, that's what I want to do. I want to be a diplomat. I want to be a foreign service officer. I think uh, basically he looked at me and was mortified at the idea of me joining his foreign service. Um, <laughs> So decided to steer me another way without me knowing. He was in contact with the agency because he worked in so many international forums. He would spot for the agency. He would spot people, right? God bless him. And uh, the next thing I know, I, I got a phone call from a federal government official. I think that's all he said at the time, inviting me to an info session. And I went down there in torn up jeans and a baggy sweater on <laughs> everyone else who was there in suit and tie. And uh, luckily, I got through the first cut, made an impression, and eventually they decided to hire me. No kidding. Were they doing uh, lifestyle polys back then and that sort of thing? Absolutely were, yeah. But you know, I was, uh, I, I guess, at 21 or, or whatever I was back then, I think I was 21. You know, I had a bunch of stuff happen to me when I was before 18. You know, stuff, you know, encounters with law enforcement or what have you, but nothing <laughs> really serious and nothing that would turn them away from me. Uh, and again, it was before I was 18. So that was all fine by them. Got it. I, I had to go through that lifestyle poly uh, in 2006 because I'd worked with uh, uh, the agency in, in Iraq and went into that program that they had in Vietnam. And then they started again after September 11th to get more people on that uh, special activities side of the house yeah. activities division. So I went and I did did all that and uh, got my class update to go to the farm and all of that. And I dropped my papers actually in the military. And wow. uh and I didn't expect the military to try to keep me in. I thought they'd just say, okay, thanks for your for your time. Because I wanted to stay in the fight after being yeah, in course. from essentially deployed on 9-11 and then through 2006. And then I was going to go to some staff job. I thought, oh, no, how about I just uh, go this route that I've been working uh, in concert with the agency back in Iraq and go that route and get right back after it. And uh, and the military decided to uh, invite me to, to be a platoon commander. So I decided to, to stay in. But I didn't even really think that was going to be an option. But point being... That lifestyle poly, that's the most uncomfortable room I've ever been in, I think. Uh, and uh, actually used it, used all the feelings and emotions behind it to describe a, uh, someone else going through that in the chapter of my, my latest novel. But uh, how many times did you have to do that over the course of all the uh, 34 years? On average, about every five years, uh, you have to, to be reinvestigated. And I, and I would suggest to you that I, I know Bud's is really hard, just having seen it. <laughs> Uh, but I, you know, the lifestyle polygraph, um, you know, for a short period of time gives it its money's worth, I suppose. <laughs> I think you're right. So it's, it's a, it's an exhaustive experience. It's not fun, as you well know, and especially having to do it every five years. But, you know, there's also, I guess, a bit of a rite of passage to it as well that we sort of mm -hmm. embrace. Yeah, no, it's very, it's very interesting. Um, and when you came in, so there's kind of this, uh, Obviously, we have the 60s, we have the 70s, terrorism on the rise around the world. We have 1983, obviously, that's a very pivotal point when we're talking about uh, uh, Islamic terrorism in particular. Uh, and then, of course, the Cold War is in full swing. So you have, did you notice it as a uh, kind of com competing um, threats uh, and as far as allocation of resources as you're starting your path? Are you focused on Cold War? Are you focused on terrorism or are you focused regionally on where you're assigned after you graduate from the farm? Really on both. And you're absolutely right. 83 was a key year for terrorism. It was his ball of shiny year. The uh, American embassy in Beirut was uh, blown up in April of that year. The Marine barracks bombing in October of that year. The following year, we'd have a series of hijackings over the next two years by his ball. But at the same time, as, as you might recall, the, the Cold War was in full throttle. Uh, between, uh, you know, President Reagan was in office and, and trying to push back on the then Soviets. They were being very uh, agitating. They were in 
Afghanistan, obviously. It invaded Afghanistan in 79. So where you are in a station, uh, the top tier targets are always going to be the top tier targets wherever you are. You could be in a you know, relative quiet place or a major city and the Russians and terrorism would be at the top of your list as well as you know, China, North Korea, Iran, issues like that. And you allocate and align based on what, how target rich your environment is, right? So if you've got greater opportunities to pursue Hezbollah as opposed to the Russians, the Soviets, whatever, you align accordingly, but you're expected to work all the top targets wherever you are. And, and you're absolutely right. Those were at the, the top of the, the food chain at the time. And it's interesting how some of those uh, those same names still keep popping up. Uh, Iran, North Korea, China, Russia, a uh, variety of terrorist organizations. Um, but before I get to some of the, uh, the meat of the book, what was the training like for you? And how did you see it? How has it evolved since 9-11 for the, the, the newer uh, case officers that are headed to the farm and then, then headed out on their first assignments? Has that training evolved? Does it still have uh, a link to, to roots? Like in Buds, we still have a rite of passage where we hold our breath and dive down just like the guys would have done in World War II to blow up obstacles in advance of a conventional force landing. Um, uh, do you have those ties back to the old OSS days? Uh, but how is that changing morphed, particularly after, after 9-11 and over the last 20 years now? It's a good question, and I, and I think it really kind of goes along with some of the themes of my book, that there have been changes, some for the better, some maybe not for the better. When I joined in 84, we still went through a, a very extensive paramilitary course. Uh, and at my time, I think it was uh, 12 weeks, including two weeks of airborne training, and which we you know, dropped out of airplanes. Uh, so we did, you know, lab week, we did, you know, boat week, we did, you know, air ops and all those things. And basically taking lessons from our OSS predecessors and also what our colleagues had done in Vietnam. Again, this is the mid eighties. Vietnam was not that long ago. All of my instructors were Vietnam combat vets uh, with the agency and the military, usually both had their feet in both camps. So, you know, we had a uh, invasion and, and we had counter interrogation and, and it was uh, often unpleasant 12 weeks. <laughs> I can only imagine the, uh, the, the agency's version of Sears School can't be that pleasant. Right, precisely, right? <laughs> um, so that's what it was, but it was it really did bond you with your colleagues. And I think even more so than the operational training, the relationships you made under those conditions were lifetime relationships. You know, I still have classmates from 38, nine years ago, whatever it is now, still call me Doug Danger. Because that was nice, thing, you know, <laughs> back there. And then we all had nicknames, right? Everybody had a crazy nickname of some sort. So that was something that we started chipping away at over the years uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, some was efficiency. Some was uh, resources. It was expensive and, and hard to maintain. 12 weeks is a long time. And as you can imagine, planes, uh, helicopters, all sorts of things involved. That's a lot of money. Um, but then we also started to, I think, take in mind that some of our new recruits weren't really as jazzed about it. Uh, it's a very, it became a more litigious generation that mm. came in. And, you know, it, I couldn't even begin to suggest it's any comparison to what you or our other special forces colleagues go through, but you get pushed around in uh, interrogation and yeah. when they capture you and, you know, make your life difficult for a while. Um, and, and perhaps there was a concern that not all of our, our folks were going to be too just about that. But, you know, if I gave them the benefit of the doubt, it's probably as much about money and resources that is just mm -hmm. expensive. And were we getting enough, you know, no pun, bang for the buck? I, I think it's a shame. I remember I had a great conversation with the famous Jack Downing, who passed away not too long ago. Mm -hmm. Jack Downing was our deputy director of operations, the head of our clandestine service. He was a decorated Marine officer in Vietnam. And um, he was the DDO when I was out on my very first chief of station assignment. And because he was that kind of leader, uh, I was, you know, a young pup and he still called me into his office. We went out to dinner and he asked me in my views. I can't believe that. In fact, that's part of the problem today. I don't think that would absolutely happen today. Mm -hmm. but maybe that will be one of the reforms that comes. But Jack wanted to hear my experiences. And we had already reduced that program a bit. And I told him, you know, I know I said, you know, I know a lot of people get banged up in the airborne training, particularly and, and the overall course. But I said, the relationships I've developed, the bonding, and also, you know, I was a, I was a Marine Reservist. I carried a PRC-77. I was not like a real infantry guy, right? But the idea of going through all this training and jumping out of planes, it made it easier for me to talk to the military officers in other countries that I was targeting. 
because, mm-hmm. you know, I, you know, once you'd say you jumped out of an airplane, that's an automatic bond with somebody else right. who went through paratrooper training. So I thought that was invaluable. And he brought it back in for a while until he moved on. So uh, on that training, we, we, we changed it out a lot. I think we still have a few components. We particularly have components which are required if you're going to hostile places, weapons training, not as much of the ground tactics as we used to do, uh, not the survival, not the counter interrogation anymore. So there's a sort of a, a sampling of it just to give you a little mm-hmm. bit of feel, but, but not, not what it was. On the operational side, I would say we've made evolutions to try to maintain pace with the changes in tradecraft and the counterintelligence threats and what the world is like out there, where you know technology has really been a new key layer to how we conduct espionage and how others try to catch us in the process. Biometrics, right? In, in my day, um, I could be made up a fake passport from any country for which I could pull off the language. And I could just be that person and leave from here or there and not be a problem. Now my fingerprints, my retina scans, all that kind of thing. And, and you need a significant backstory because you can't just have been invented today. You have to have a life that goes back with Facebook and social media. People could kind of go, go far back. So we've had to adapt to that. And, and I know we're trying, but one of the points I make in my book is that I fear the agency got so off track from being focused as an espionage service. It was very absorbed with combat support and its own paramilitary and kinetic operations that we didn't pay enough attention to tradecraft, to you know, the traditional espionage that, that we need to do. And again, today, as we shift to great power competition, as we realign from a, a prioritization of terrorism, and all the other services in the world have gotten better over these years. And they've been able to harness technology to beat us, sadly, and certainly to make it harder for us to do our jobs to recruit agents in the first place and then to run them clandestinely. So I I think, you know, there will hopefully be, as we have a a new chief of the clandestine service, a new director and deputy director, greater attention to, we're going to have to make some changes because we not only have some services caught up, they might have surpassed us at this point. And we need to do our homework in order to not only be competitive, but be the elite premier foreign intelligence service of the world. Oh yeah, I can only imagine facial recognition technology from uh, foreign intelligence services and, and commercially available uh, facial recognition technology as well, um, and how you have to adapt to that. But uh, I really think about those people who were kind of caught in the middle of that change, where they may have traveled under under alias uh, prior to, and then as this technology continues to develop, all of a sudden they're showing up in a different country under a different name. Yet the facial recognition technology says there's someone else. Um, I can only imagine the problems that that, uh, that may cause to, uh, to people in that line of work. It, it would not end well. <laughs> yep. Uh, and uh, so you missed the church hearings by almost a decade, but you're, you're coming in, you're stepping into the service that's probably still feeling the effects of the, the church hearings in the, in the mid-70s. Yep. Um, what, did, uh, what, did, what were people talking about at that time as far as how things were before the church hearings and after, and were some of those oversights uh, that was implemented in the, in the wake of the church hearings, were those beneficial to the agency long-term and to the, the, uh, the nation as a whole? What were your thoughts on, on that, having talked to people who were in the middle of it? I think the, those in my early years who were who actually survived and were there in the service at the time were burned by such episodes as the Halloween massacre, where Stansel Turner just, you know, on Halloween basically fired, what, 800, I think, some idea. 830 or something. Yeah, right. Great. Um, so I, I think there was a lot of apprehension and hesitation to what oversight was going to be. And could we trust oversight, uh, you know, with our, with our dearest secrets? My experience actually over you know all those years was fairly positive of oversight. Mm-hmm. Behind closed doors, I found members of both party were a lot more bipartisan. And mm-hmm. it really came down to be honest with us. You be honest with us and we will help you do your job. Be dishonest with us and we will shut you down. So still there's always a reluctance not to open up a Pandora's box or what have you, but you answer their questions and you give them what they ask for. Um, mm-hmm. And there's generally less political play in terms of even covert action. Because remember, covert action, oversight doesn't get to reject, let's say. The president decides of a, on a covert action program. He sends a memorandum of notification to oversight committees, to Congress. What they then control is the budget. 
So they, in theory, can shut it down monetarily. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, over different administrations, Democratic and Republican would have to go to, to the Hill. And while the Hill wouldn't necessarily be in favor of a, of a presidential program, they just wanted to know, was it meeting its, you know, were the measures of effectiveness accurate? Was it meeting uh, goals? Was it right for the nation? And were you doing it honestly? So since it's really, we're kind of in a unique place, uh, CIA is a secret organization operating in open society, right? That's tricky, right? Because there's got to be enough transparency with the American public, but we can't also share our secrets because that will get people killed. So we've got an elected system, right? So they elect Congress, they elect the president. So their representatives of whatever party in oversight are their representatives for the oversight. I, I kind of think that's a healthy thing. Yeah. And I think as long as when it's done right, it works well. Um, there are exceptions. Um, I, I'll cite specifically, I think uh, Pompeo, when he was on the oversight committee, really had a, a bone in his teeth on Benghazi which you know, we in, in the agency thought wasn't accurate. Uh, we had been open and transparent about what happened there at Benghazi and, and what went wrong and, and what have you, but he was using probably the committees there for a greater political goal, which was the exception in my time. Mm-hmm. That changed a little bit, I think, uh, when um, we got to the last few years of my, my service, which was a mix of moving out from under the Obama administration and into the Trump administration, where I think less was being shared with Congress by directive of the White House. And that then made things tricky. And I think too much debate about intelligence activities was out in the open and was then very political because it wasn't in closed doors. It wasn't where everybody could be comfortable to say what they were gonna say because it was a classified record and they just wanted honesty. They wanted honesty, they wanted measures of effectiveness. Then it became more of a political football, which made oversight tricky, uh, because at the end of the day, your director has to approve what you go and do, or even just you're going to oversight. And when the president is saying, I will not allow people to go to oversight, then oversight is going to come out in the open and make things mm-hmm. more difficult and start shutting off the money. Well, I do want to ask you about that, about uh, uh, political weaponization of intelligence and what that means for both citizens and the agency. Um, and did you see that? Was that a... Uh, was that a tide kind of that was creeping throughout your whole time, or was it something that just happened post 9-11 and happened even more so as we get closer to 2021 here? But uh, the, the political weaponization of intelligence, was that something that you recognized in 1984 at all, um, or is it something that, uh, that came on the scene a lot later? So the CIA, like all the executive agencies, work for the executive. They work for the president of the United States, right? And that's their, that's their boss. So there's always been a degree of politicalization. I think you could look in the 70s. You could look at the Team B uh, project, right? That's where, you know, the CIA said that, you know, there's not a missile gap with the Soviet Union on nuclear missiles. Um, here's where they're at. Here's what we think their plans and intentions but you had people who, like uh, Paul Wolfowitz, who then became Deputy Secretary of Defense under Rumsfeld during the time of 9-11, who absolutely protested that along with Rumsfeld at the time. So President Ford appointed a separate team of outside experts, so to speak, all of whom had a bias, who came in and came up with different findings. Now, history bears out the CIA's findings were the correct ones. Team B's mm-hmm. were incorrect. So that was a classic example of globalization. What I fear happened post 9-11 was, it happened on a larger scale, and it was both top down and bottom up in the sense that CIA at at 9-11 believed that we could be in fear of being eliminated, uh, absorbed by Department of Defense or the FBI. It was was an existential threat. Um, The CIA got a lot of things right, actually, 9-11. Uh, but they got a lot of things wrong, mostly in terms of sharing what they already knew. Mm. They had been ringing the alarm bells about 9-11. It's more than just the bin Laden determined to strike the homeland, presidential daily brief of August that everybody puts mm-hmm. out. But you can go back months and months earlier and many and many a finished product, which reached the White House, was saying they're determined to strike here. There's something coming up. It is inevitable there's going to be a, an attack. And uh, that's the good part, right, in terms of doing their job. The bad part was they didn't talk enough to the FBI. There was no Department of Homeland Security. They didn't talk to what was then Immigration and Naturalization Service. So 
there is a lot of flaws that I would say, yeah, you can call that absolutely an intelligence failure. Um, but CIA yeah, thought it might be out of business. So the agency looked at what can we do to save ourselves? We had a new senior leadership, and I'm not talking just the director because George Tennant was still director. And, and, and I thought very well of George Tennant when I worked for him prior to 9-11, and I had some interactions with him. But uh, the DDO, the uh, deputy director of CIA, came from a sort of different read, and, and they were... Uh, particularly the, the senior chap, was very uh, military in his approach and thought we could really bank on our covert action authorities. And CIA's covert action authorities are unique. The president can, in theory, by law, designate any agency to conduct a deniable activity, but uh, it's usually CIA and, and for a good reason. It's smaller, it's more compact, and it tends to be more agile. So we could do covert action, which means we could do a range of activities from um, conducting kinetic operations in a sovereign state with which we're not at war. Um, and that would be mainly Pakistan, which is where most, much of Al-Qaeda had fled to, but not just Pakistan, elsewhere. We could do something about all the detainees coming off the battlefield that the FBI won't take because they have no charges. Uh, we came up thus with the black sites. And then sadly, because I think it's perhaps the biggest blot in my career uh, on the agency would be the Enhanced Interrogation Program, which we use. And uh, together, those basically solved a lot of problems, but changed the culture of the agency and thus allowed it to be more politicized. Certainly in, uh, in the case of Iraq in 2002, there's a famous national intelligence estimate in which there are only two agencies that uh, dissented. One, ironically, is uh, State Department's INR, Intelligence and Research, the other being uh, the Department of Energy, who said, no, we don't believe there's weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Now, the CIA knew better at an expert level, but when Vice President Cheney is being brought in the building and Vice President Cheney and the CIA leadership is sitting down with a bunch of poor, you know, late 20, 30-year-old analysts, that's kind of an intimidating situation to be in. And it certainly allowed for, unfortunately, a bit of the perversion of the intelligence on which the White House then justified its invasion. But it continued to go down that road, I saw, where... The culture changed in the agency. It got much more fixated on, on supporting the White House, on paramilitary operations. And I think we lost a lot in terms of our credibility in being an objective reporter uh, for our consumers based on those ties. Now you talk about that a lot, the paramilitary side of the House um, versus the case officer side of the House and what happened at 9-11 um, to really change the culture of the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, and you talk about the CIA as being at a crossroads. And has it been in a crossroads since 9-11, or is this now in 2021? Are we at another crossroads now that we're essentially out of Iraq, essentially out of Afghanistan, um, that that uh, we're, we're moving forward here? Um, and how has that changed from the original charter of the CIA in 1947 to, to what it has become today? Um, so what, what is that cultural shift? And are we at a new crossroads now in 2021? A different one maybe than we were in 2001. No, fair question. So from 9-11 on, I think less than a crossroads, we were on a descending path. Mm. We were on a path away from our charter. The CIA's charter is, in fact, foreign intelligence collection, analysis, and covert action. There's supposed to be some balance. And generally, covert action is something, if you want to keep it deniable, you don't do very much of. It's very selective. It has to be basically tested against, do we really need to do this? Is there any other way to accomplish this goal? And do we need to do it secretly, right? So can the US military conduct an operation or do we need to do it where the United States says, we don't know what you're talking about because the CIA did it. Um, do we need to covertly influence or can diplomacy take care of that? And just you know a good narrative on the part of the government. So we slid so much towards covert action activities, and unfortunately not enough covert influence, because I actually think that's a good one and would have been very useful in countering extremism and terrorism and such like that, but really then became a very paramilitary focused organization where our goals were find, fix, finish in terms of terrorist targets. Um, unlike the Vietnam era, where the CIA had a huge footprint in Vietnam, it didn't really affect the overall mission. It didn't affect the overall clandestine service. There were professional paramilitary people being sent in there. There was a paramilitary mission, which they did well. Uh, and then they came back and some were 
sort of rebranded and tried to put in traditional jobs or kept in the paramilitary side. The CIA, and, and this part I agree with, rotated everybody through the war zones, or pretty much everybody through, on the clandestine side, on the operational side, not on the analytic or support, but, but a great many of them went because obviously support tends to often be bigger than the teeth of the dog, mm-hmm. right, in terms of making it function. So a great many of us went. But what, what happened was careers were being advanced not on, hey, you know, that woman recruited a great Russian agent. It's, hey, that person ran a great platform in a war zone, or that person was part of that paramilitary program or that kinetic program. So there was less of that nurturing of classic espionage skills and tradecraft skills and, and much more on the other skills. And those are the people who were then advancing, who would in turn have less classic traditional operational experience as they rose up, which would then sort of give them a different perspective on human intelligence, on the value of agents, on the value of those handling our agents, which put us, I think, on this descending path, which changed the culture. Um, I talk in my book and I, and I regularly say uh, how in, in my day, as even a junior officer on my first tour, I would go in and see the chief of my division, now a center chief, it's equivalent to like a, a, a general, right? In charge of a, literally a division uh, of troops, right? Though much smaller for us. Uh, and it would be a first name thing because it was all about them being in touch with the workforce and then kind of charging my motivation by going, tell me about your agents, tell me about the cool things you're doing, Doug. That simply went away where our senior officers became chief and sir, and untouchables, and and in a position where they didn't want to hear a different opinion than what they had already come to conclude. That was the descending path. Crossroads today, absolutely, because there is at least a recognition that our mission has to change. It sounds kind of familiar. We need to spy on the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, the Iranians. You know, okay, I remember that pretty well. (laughs) Right, that's classic espionage. We're not going to be sending, you know, drone strikes into Moscow. We're not going to be, you know, detaining Chinese officials and putting them in black sites. We need to recruit them as spies and run them so that they don't get caught. We need to counter Russian disinformation or Chinese disinformation or cyber attacks from them, the Iranians, the North Koreans, and God knows how many criminal organizations are out there doing that. That means being smarter, not just being stronger. That's not just brute force. So we do find ourselves now at that crossroads, but it's a difficult place to be because the leadership ranks have been so built by those who profited from the last 20 years in terms of personal advancement, right? And personal professional advancement that uh, we didn't really reward as much those who were focused on tradecraft. And to your point, and I don't want to steal your thunder for we get to it later on accountability, when things did go wrong, rather than sort of internally, and not to the American public, God knows, but internally go, what did we do wrong? Who's responsible? And does someone need to be disciplined? It was all about circling the wagons. It was all about deflecting the, the accountability. And you're not going to learn from that. And you're only going to perpetuate those who made mistakes as they continue to invest because they'll make the same mistakes again. So I think the current leadership is at a great place right now. They have the opportunity. Uh, Ambassador Burns does. Mr. Cohen does. Dave Marlowe, the new chief of the clandestine service. And these are three men that I actually respect. I've worked with all of them. I admire all of them. Um, and I, I think their heart's in the right place. I see some good reflections, uh, at least what I see publicly, in terms of people being moved out, people mm-hmm. being moved in, and taking care of our people. The Havana Task Force, the Syndrome Task Force, I think you know that was something that Gina Haspel would not do. Pompeo, obviously, would, would not even consider it. And I think that means a lot to the workforce. I think they will likewise, I hope, embrace the ideals of the diversity and inclusiveness we need. And it's not just no political correctness. We're a foreign intelligence service. I'm an old white guy. Who's going to be more effective in some countries, an old white guy or somebody who can look the part, speak the language, understands the culture? It makes us a stronger intelligence service. It's not a political influence. Yeah, no, you do, uh, you cover that in the book, and I, I once again I encourage everybody to to read this. And I love the title. So the recruiter spying and the lost art of American intelligence, the lost art, and uh, that's this last twenty years, the shift to the paramilitary side of the house, people working in positions that would have in the past 
been reserved for those who had come really from the case officer ranks, uh, recruiting agents and, and that sort of thing are now occupied by people who are doing essentially what uh, U.S. Army Special Forces does, going into countries, doing foreign internal defense, uh, unconventional warfare, that that side of the house. Um, but uh, when, when, we t- when we talk about successes and failures of the, of the CIA, um, and the, the public usually hears something along the lines of the successes never see the light of day. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you say, you talk about that a bit in, in the book. And so what we hear about more often than not are the failures because there's political capital there to be gained by different people on intelligence committees or wherever else that they are. Um, and it, it becomes very politicized of course, but in the age of WikiLeaks, social media, transparency, all these things, um, I think it, sometimes it's harder for the public to believe that, uh, that an agency, especially the federal government, wouldn't want to highlight some of these successes, especially if we can go back to 1947, 50, 55, go back to some old things in the past that maybe not uh, might not give up these sources and methods, just to highlight a couple things along the way that, uh, that we might have done, may have done right. Um, do you think that that, that uh, it's time to maybe highlight a couple of those successes, even for, because we did talk about how this is a clandestine, this is a clandestine service in an open society. Um, but uh, I think it's just harder today for a, for especially for a generation that's growing up, posting every single piece of their life, essentially, um, to believe that a, uh, a government organization wouldn't want to highlight a couple more successes, especially if they're from the past. Yeah, but uh, the equation is different, right? Uh, You know, to compare it to a good con, a good con is when the person doesn't know their pocket's been picked, ever, right? Because for one thing, not only is it a matter of the sources that were involved, it also in some cases could require them to retaliate. So when there's, you know, somebody just happens to become dead in a foreign country, um, and if the United States uh, acknowledges something like that, then that country has to do something about it. So case of uh, Qasem Soleimani is, is a great uh, point of that. Uh, the, the head of the IRGC Quds Force, Iran, who the United States um, killed in a targeted uh, effort with, with drones in, in Iran. Uh, Soleimani was a problem and he was a threat, but it would have probably been better had he been struck by an explosive in Syria without the United States having to acknowledge it. Because once we acknowledged it, uh, we got a whole lot of ballistic missiles fired our way. And Probably it was only because both sides were then trying to avoid a spiral of escalation that it didn't go any further because I think those missiles could have easily hit square on our people at our various military and diplomatic installations and didn't. And yet still, I think over 100 of our people suffered traumatic brain injury just from the concussion of the force. It could have been a lot worse. So there's there's that reason for why you Mm. sometimes never want to acknowledge what you did, because if you do, then there's going to have to be a consequence because Countries can't internally just ride that out and say, oh, okay, good on the United States. You had us. It was 30 years ago. Ha, ha, ha. Let's just call it all friends. There's also sources and methods, right? So even in my book, I take pains to dilute details. I don't indicate any country in which these, these stories are from. I have to give a very pale description of my agents because I don't want to give such physical detail that people could know, oh, that this guy was that age and had this skin color, or that complexion and such like that because you also have a lifelong commitment to them, but also their families. Mm -hmm. So even if they're no longer with us, their families are, and there could be retaliation against their families, particularly in countries that are hostile towards us. So I would love it if we could kind of like talk about our successes and tell the American public, but again, that's what they've got their elected representatives for. That's what oversight's about. And they have to ideally trust their oversight that, yeah, the CIA is keeping you safe at night. It is sometimes, your first, last, and best form of defense against horrors that, God willing, you'll never even know about. And, and I worry more that people start losing faith in oversight as they lose faith in government and all these various you know, sources of news and how many are spun for whatever their particular audience is, because oversight does work. The CIA is out there doing wonderful and heroic things, generally uh, at great risk to keep them safe. And we are going to screw up, but there also has to be a tolerance for screwing up, where if it's not uh, a failure of negligence or incompetence, you know, operations are dynamic and they deal with with human beings. And you never always know how people are going to behave in certain circumstances. So there's going to have to be some room, but there certainly should be accountability for when things are knowingly done wrong. And certainly for the wrong reasons. 
Yeah, and then when you mentioned the uh, Soleimani case right there, um, a lot of times we forget in this country when we think in terms of four-year election cycles and for the real deep thinkers among us, eight years, um, that uh, Iran, China, the other countries under, other countries like that, they can think in terms not just of decades, but centuries. Um, so uh, they won't be forgetting about that. Uh, I talk about that in my, my latest novel as well. Um, but I guess what I mean when I'm talking about WikiLeaks and all, and all that sort of thing, it's when you see something that uh, has been on the public radar for so long and it's so uh, attached when, we, when people think conspiracy, what's the first thing that comes to mind? They think, JFK assassination. And it's yeah. just, and, and then you have, uh, president Trump say he's going to declassify something from 1963. And at the last moment he gets a visit from people at the central intelligence agency and then doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> and so the American people think, come on, what they're look at all these books, look at all these videos, what could possibly be. So there's something and they cite sources and methods from 1963, but to an assassination of our own president, which is, which is, um, why people, I think there's always that question there. And I, and I think it's, uh, you know, maybe it, maybe it doesn't help, uh, when, uh, when it's really important to keep some things under wraps. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on, on that one? Cause it is such a part of our, our, our culture and, and even popular culture now with movies and films and everything else references, uh, it, so often, more often than not, when people talk about a different conspiracy theory, they bring that up as an example. Well, conspiracy theories are definitely entertaining, and it's not just Americans. Uh, every culture I've ever uh, lived with uh, has that same kind of sense because they're spicy, they're sensational, right? And they're sexy. Um, the reality of, of a lot of intelligence work and a lot of the reasons things don't get declassified are really rather boring, but they, they do affect people's lives. If it, if it was simply embarrassment, that's not the kind of stuff they protect. They certainly expose and, and, and present a whole lot of things that are embarrassing. It's really about sources and methods. Is, is this going to cause harm to us as a nation or to individuals? And I can't speak to what the whole Kennedy thing was and 63 thing was, but the, the cases where I've seen brought to us and uh, you know, Freedom of Information Act uh, and such like that, which they go to court, it's, it's, a, it's a fair hearing. And in fact, generally the public does better than we wish they did. Um, the Presidential Policy Guidance in 2013, which regulated the uh, use of kin uh, or kinetic operations outside of conflict zones, uh, still it was redacted, but released. It was a very revealing document, which we saw the consequences. We saw it help our adversaries because they knew what we were doing, the thresholds we needed before we could launch an attack or launch a missile, and they took more precautions. And, and that was after a hearing and a judge ruled and such, and we made our case. And they still let out the bulk of that document. So, you know, while I know there's always a propensity that there must be something else, there's always a bigger story. You know, having been in the secret world for all these years, it's, uh, it's usually nothing very exciting. It's something very routine or something very significant, which um, was the reason why it's being held back. Yeah, some of those are so tough, like the example you just you mentioned right there, because it does give the enemy ammunition as far as countering what we're doing that may be effective. Um, well, now they know exactly when we're not going to press that button and, and take right. that, make that strike. And then, of course, it, a lot of that on our side is to prevent collateral damage, because you know that's one thing that uh, as a as a nation that I saw that that made me proud over my time in the in, in the military was just how much effort we put into minimizing or eliminating in many cases any collateral damage. Um, and not many countries in the world do that. And I think it's important for us to maintain that moral high ground because oftentimes that's the only thing that differentiates us from the enemy is maintaining that moral high ground. Um, but uh, uh, the intelligence community in general has grown quite a bit since since 9-11, um, as has our, our government in general. But um, has that been to the benefit of the mission or to the detriment of the mission as far as creating uh, a larger bureaucracy maybe to have to navigate? Um, so has that been beneficial in since you saw before and after? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? That's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that. And, and, and I get that sometimes. Uh, there's a danger of me having my own bias in it. But what you point to is certainly one of the downsides is the additional bureaucracy. So when the office of the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, was established, it was established actually only with a DNI front office and one agency, the National Counterterrorist Center, if you recall. Mm -hmm. I believe there's four centers uh, under the DNI. There is one for counterintelligence, there's one for cyber, uh, there's one for nuclear proliferation, right? And it just continues to expand. As you do that, 
you know, the intelligence pot, for one thing, is finite, right? So the more agencies, the more people, the more that pot has to be divided. So that's obviously going to have an impact. A lot of these agencies also find themselves in redundant positions, particularly the analytic ones, and particularly the analytical ones under the DNI, where their mission is not to conduct an operation, not to collect signals intelligence, not to run agents, but to study the intel that comes in and come up with analytic assessments. There's a value there to be sure. It's certainly due diligence. It's a sanity check. It's a it's a different perspective, which I think is helpful. And in some cases, it's intended to be a fusion of other agencies reporting, which is great. But people forget the Central Intelligence Agency was the Central Intelligence Agency for a reason. It was a fusion center. It was created to be this independent clearinghouse for the entire community, which is why the then director of Central Intelligence was put over it. So now you still have a CIA, which has multiple missions that are being done by multiple other agencies, but then you have yet other new agencies looking at the same issues, but without the operational advantage. CIA analysts have the advantage of working right with their clandestine partners. And we've created fusion centers within the CIA so that every geographic or functional area, be it counterproliferation, counterterrorism, Russia, China, is a fused group of analysts, operators, technical people, those detailed from the soft community, from the State Department, from Treasury. So it's a real great microcosm of of our government. Because they're in a much more protected, secure environment, they could see a lot more of the details that maybe the analysts at the National Counterterrorism Center or Proliferation Center don't. So when they're then making their judgments to inform decision-making, they don't have the privy of all the sensitive, of every bit of sensitive information, hmm. but because it's that sensitive, we keep it in a small circle to begin with. So the analyst working on that project in the CIA may be a cluster of a dozen or something like that. And even they're the only ones who know about it, but they at least have the final say because they see all, right, for their particular area of expertise. And NCTC, to its credit, is going to go, we disagree with that, and we can't then tell them, but that's because you don't know about this operation or this technical effort or whatever like that. So I don't know how efficient it is. I think there's definitely a value to having different perspectives and different organizations that come at it with a different take. I'd I'd love to find a way to get that done without the bureaucratic tail, the resource tail that goes along with that. Yeah. And uh, we're talking about this post 9-11 period that was uh, so formative as far as a cultural shift in the agency goes. Um, And you mentioned enhanced interrogation techniques, um, how the agency embraced it. In the book, you talk about that being something that they saw as something that could differentiate themselves from the Department of Defense uh, that was really um, kind of taking the lead in the war on terror at the time. So when we talk about enhanced interrogation techniques and we talk about extraordinary rendition program and talk about black sites uh, to the public, those kind of those are overlapping programs, I think, to most of the the American uh, people when we're when we're talking about these things. Um, I guess. Was there a is it a net negative? um, All those programs uh, looking back over these last 20 years based off um, what informa- information and intelligence that we were actually able to garner from them, um, or uh, were they a net positive? Uh, and it, it, I mean, now we have a little bit benefit of hindsight because we have twenty years of of data to look at. And um, so, what, what do you what do you think about those things? Would the, would the agency be better off? Would the country be better off had we not done those things? One or two? Had we done them and had they not come to light? So I, I actually like the way you present the question because uh, it is broad, there's overlap to it, but the American public sees it just as one effort. The idea of finding some place to detain and debrief combatants that you can try in the Southern District of New York kind of makes sense, right? Uh, who should do it? Should it be CIA? Should it be DOD? Because they're combatants after all. And just like any prison of war, doesn't the Department of Defense have a right to hold them somewhere? I'm no lawyer. But that seems what we always do in wartime. We capture combatants and we debrief them. Um, the CIA got involved because no one else was able to do it, right? Department of Defense, for whatever reason, didn't have the authorities. FBI wouldn't touch them because they couldn't prosecute them. That the CIA would have to go and find some of these people to pick them up for detention, well, that's a covert activity. That kind of makes sense, too. 
where we fall off the, 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 the face of the earth here is enhanced interrogation. So that was a program that was outsourced. It was actually developed by Air Force, former Air Force psychologists. There weren't case officers involved, which I find extraordinary. It's, it's America's premier foreign intelligence service. And you don't have our foreign intelligence collectors involved with debriefing people of information. You know, case officers, despite movies and books and, and what have you, we don't coerce agents into cooperating. There's no value to us. It's not just that you can't really assess what they're giving you. Is it true? Is it being deceptive? But do I want to go put my life in the hands of somebody I'm blackmailing, blasting <laughs> clandestinely in the middle of the night, who can likewise kill me and just walk away? Uh, no. So, you know, it should have been case officers involved. I debriefed detainees, but as I dealt with people as a case officer, I used rapport, I used engagement with them, right? And I talk about that a little bit in my book. But the idea that we would subject detainees to the abuse that they went through is anathema to a case officer. I mean, we're all about the grease of rapport, making sure they're motivated, making sure it's in their interest to work with us and cooperate. I would tell you from the years that, that passed, it's not only the value of the intelligence from those programs did not come near meriting the, the cost to us because you know, there's 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 one passage uh, in, in a public source about um, one particular terrorist, Hassan Ghul, and Hassan Ghul was an Al Qaeda facilitator, or I know too well. It's all uh, out in public, and uh, we uh, he was caught by a partner service, uh, turned over to us. But before it turned over, pretty much told us as much as he would tell us during abuse. He was forthcoming. He was a forthcoming guy, and, and he kind of knew the jig was up. Now, that's not fair to say that they all would because Al-Qaeda trains its people to resist interrogation by pretending to cooperate, mm -hmm. by giving them tidbits and trying to lead them away from the most important information. But if you read, uh, for example, Peter Bergen's recent book about the uh, rise of Osama bin Laden, he talks accurately, because I saw it there, how some of these individuals like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Abu Faraj al-Libi were giving us false information after being waterboarded hundreds of times. So there's the efficacy and there's the consequence. The efficacy, I already would tell you, I do not see it. I see no value in it. Just like I see no value in blackmailing an agent. It's just not efficient. But the cost, I then have to go out and recruit people, recruit terrorists or whomever, and say, listen, you can trust not only me, not only my service, but my country. And they're going to go, yeah, like you tortured these other people. Yeah. That's going to make that conversation a little bit awkward when I'm trying to stand on the moral high ground that you need to talk to us, oh, Russian intel officer, old oh, terrorist person, because the United States wants the best, right? We're trying to keep the world from going to war. We're trying to, you know, change the Russian uh, oligarchy into a more democratic system. I lose credibility when I have a blot like that on the record of my service and I go into that meeting with this individual. So there's a huge cost to that. There's a huge cost to the U.S. narrative as being the beacon of democracy. Uh, and stuff. So, yeah, I, 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 nothing good came of that at all. Interesting. And you also talk about this post 9-11 uh, time frame where the agency began to re reward conformists. Uh, and promote conformists within the ranks, even people failing, failing forward in a lot of instances, kind of like we've seen in the military over the last 20 years. Um, can you talk about uh, the person you call Lex in, uh, in, in the book here and what you saw with, uh, with his progression? And uh, there's some Iranian agents in there that are, that are lost along, along the way as well. And um, just what you saw in those post 9-11 years as far as this conformity, this uh, this failing forward uh, and what that meant for the intelligence service. Lex was a good case officer in his day as a, as a working level case officer. He certainly had that charisma, that gift of, of gab, if you would. Um, he also attached himself to the right people at the right times. So as he became more senior, uh, his first senior job was one that involved Iran where we lost a great many Iranian assets. There's a lot of blame to be shared, right? but it should have also fallen upon him and his chief, but they basically protected one another. And while we suffered a, a significant loss to our collection at a particularly crucial time, no one really paid the consequence, particularly not them. That was sort of the, the start of things. 
Lex himself is a former military officer. He's a very religious person. He's devoutly religious. Uh, and he kind of liked the, the hierarchy and discipline of the military, which he thought was missing in the agency and missing mm -hmm. in the clandestine service. So when he rose to senior positions in the clandestine service and in the agency broadly, he started to impose those. And he was there at the right time. He was there um, right after 9-11 and right after Iraq. So he was in a position to do that. And he then would nurture the careers of those like himself and those who approved of what he was doing because that was then the key to success. It was basically not what you did, it wasn't the meritocracy, but who you knew. And a lot of it came from, don't rock the boat, don't be a troublemaker. If the emperor thinks he's wearing beautiful clothes, but he's naked, tell him, I love your outfit. <laughs> and those were the people that were advanced under Lex's term. Mm. And Lex had that power for a long period of time. That's a generational impact on the agency. That's part of what enabled that tremendous change in the culture of the organization to drift away. And it was Lex who was there when that program was initiated. It was Lex who was authorizing it, yet there's no accountability, no paper trail, because one of the things Lex did well was he gave a lot of verbal orders. He'd pick up the secure phone and say, this is what I want done. Then a cable would be sent out by somebody else because every cable from headquarters is, comes from director. Right? It's not mm -hmm. from person, it's director, right? Because every cable speaks to the director of CIA. Interesting. So it, it sort of allows for him to kind of evade some of the scrutiny. But even those officers who came under scrutiny, the senior ones, didn't, didn't suffer for it. And Gina Haspel was the officer running one of these black sites who burnt the tapes of enhanced interrogation. And, and it would have been probably an impediment to her being a director under certain administrations, but it seemed to be an advantage for her in a Trump administration. So, you know, where was the accountability? Where was the accountability for Coast? You know, the, the, the Coast is, is the most tragic of events where I lost a number of my colleagues, colleagues that I knew as well, in, in a tradecraft debacle that should have never happened, but was sort of a sign of the times with Lex all the way at the top, this need to prove our you know, performance to the White House Let's take shortcuts. And by the way, let's make the chief of base someone who has no operational training or experience, but who's someone who we like. This is one of those cases that uh, when we're looking at operations in the, in the military that, uh, that go sideways, uh, it's what we owe those people who died, what we owe their families is to pass those lessons on to the next generation so they don't happen again. Uh, and I think from what I know about Coast, um, is, uh, is, it's a similar scenario. Um, do you think that the agency has learned from those mistakes or do they circle the wagons on, on that one, um, to protect certain careers, um, moving forward? And, and what happened there? We had an agent, uh, you have a, essentially a triple agent coming to, to base, not being, um, uh, well, one vetted properly and then two physically patted down or anything like that and welcomed into this base. A welcoming party comes out to meet and, of course, uh, explosion and uh, multiple people killed. Um, can you go into that a little bit a little bit more for those who have uh, don't know about it or who have may perhaps forgotten? So uh, being an intel officer, it's always bottom line up front. The bottom line was it was about circling the wagons after the fact to protect those. Not a single officer was disciplined. Not a single senior officer had their career derailed. In fact, the most senior officers in the chain of command involved, both in the field and at headquarters, advanced to even higher positions and received promotions in the years to come. The culprit was an individual named Abu Dijana. He was a Jordanian doctor. He had become radicalized. He was in touch with um, extremists, both in country and out through the internet. He was arrested by the Jordanian Intelligence Service, known as the General in, uh, Intelligence Director, the GID, with whom we have a very close and constructive partnership. Uh, while he was in jail, he was basically pitched, right? It was a jailhouse recruit. The officer, the case officer who pitched him was a Jordanian officer. He was a, he was a member of the royal family, uh, which means he had a lot of sway and a lot of autonomy. And he pitched this person that basically, I'll let you out if you work for me. As I've said before, the default for Al-Qaeda and its partner groups is to say, okay, I'll work with you, but not really deliver. Abu Dijana did just that. He made some trips. He made some travels. Uh, he kept talking about who he was in touch with and uh, what they were giving him. 
In fact, he was in touch with a number of bad people, uh, which is why when you vet an agent, you don't just vet and you know, validate them based on their access. It's not just what their access is, but what their agenda is, what their motivations are. Are they being controlled? Are they fabricating? Are they deceiving? Yes, we could, in some technical ways, validate that he was talking to some well-placed terrorist officials and, and Al-Qaeda and its partner groups, uh, but there was no evidence that, uh, that we could prove that he really was loyal, that we could trust his veracity or his intentions. He was never met by a CIA officer. Uh, not in Jordan nor elsewhere. The first meeting with the CIA officer was going to be this meeting of space. So Abu Dujana, in his reporting to the Jordanians, was promising great access to the most highest levels. In fact, there were those who thought his access will allow us to find, I think, more Zawahiri at the time than, than Osama bin Laden. Remember, this is, this is 2009, and bin Laden was still alive as well. And so, you know, the Jordanians, as we find out a little bit in Joby Warwick's book, Triple Agent, uh, the title that you mentioned, does talk a little bit about this, how there were people in the Jordanian service who were worried about the case. But the perception, the narrative was, well, that's because it's a royal family member. Mm. They're jealous of him. He's a young punk or whatever, and they, they don't like how he's moving up so fast. We had voices in our own stations raising the alarm bells. There's something wrong here. Because Abu Dujana went off the grid for a while at times, and we can never account for what happened to him, right? And some officers in the stations that were involved, in Jordan headquarters and, of course, Kabul, were kind of saying, yeah, but we're a little bit worried about him. We've never met him ourselves. We've never met him in Jordan. You know, we have not had an opportunity to assess him directly. It's just his access we're assessing. And yeah, he's seeing some bad guys, but what does he do when he disappears, right? So there were any number of warning signs. The chief of base, uh, Ford Operational Base Chapman, uh, host base in the host province, was one of the best targeters you will ever meet. Um, and, and, and she's now exposed in public, Jennifer Matthews. I knew her, I liked her, she worked for me at one point in my career, and she was a stupendous targeter in terms of the investigative work that puts together who this person is, what they're like, where we might find them, and why there's someone to be concerned about. Jennifer did very well. She was very well liked by her senior management. She was very much a company person. Um, and so her reward was to be chief of the states in Coast, making operational decisions. Coast base included an operational arm and a paramilitary arm. She had a senior operational advisor. She had a senior paramilitary advisor. When Jennifer came up with the plan to have this uh, Abu Dijana brought to the base without being patted down because we didn't want to offend him or scare him, um, both the operational advisor and the paramilitary advisor dissented. They say, this is not right. It's dangerous. We don't know who this guy is. It's a risk. We don't like anybody in this space you know, who doesn't go through security. Um, she declined their advice. And she was joined by an officer senior to her in her chain of command who was there that day, who was subsequently also badly injured, but had no complaint or criticism about the decision. They were actually baking a cake because it was going to be his birthday with which to greet him. She required the entire staff to be out there, except for some who were crashing on something or, or baking the cake, if you would, because I think the cake hadn't been made yet. And Abu Dujana came, and as you know, he wouldn't come out of the car at first. And the, the security officers who like, you know, said, okay, we got a problem here, and trying to force me to get out of the car. What he did, he ignited his, his, his explosive. And I've been to Coast Space enough times. Uh, I've seen still the the pock marks from the ball bearings and the walls that are still there, the monument that was there up until the Taliban took it over to my fallen colleagues. And the, the real um, tragedy of it was not all, not just all the mistakes that were made that led, but how the wagons were circled afterwards. Any officer who had a complaint or a criticism was essentially muffled, sidelined. I had an officer apply for a position to work for me who had these terrible evaluations. I asked his supervisor, who was all part of that, really bad mouthed this guy. I didn't see anything else. I wound up having him come. I accepted him to work with me. Terrific officer. And after we got to know each other for a while, he explained to me, yeah, here's what had happened. He didn't even say it first off. He didn't say, oh, the reason I had a bad re uh, evaluation was this. It took him a while before he would sit down mm -hmm. and say, yeah, I wrote a lot of criticisms of my deputy, of my chief, and of the program because I was close friends with the case officer who was killed, who likewise was complaining and criticizing. And it was all basically squashed. And not only was there punishment, all those officers in those senior ranks all continued to advance. Yeah, unfortunately, that's something that we 
seeing more and more of, I think. Um, and I understand if you can't, uh, can't talk about this, um, because it does involve a, uh, extraordinary rendition for you. And is it an extreme rendition or extraordinary rendition? I, we just call them renditions. Renditions. Okay. I mean, any rendition is going to be extreme. So, you know, okay. Same. Got it. Um, uh, so the, uh, this is the uh, Abu Omar case, the rendition program in 2003 in Italy that was highly publicized in newspapers and magazines online, um, where 22 suspected CIA officers are convicted by an Italian judge. I think one was eventually, uh, was in Portugal uh, and was arrested there. But um, w w one, can you comment on that? And what can we learn from that? Or have we learned? It seems like that one may have been one that we learned from because it's so hard not to learn lessons from that one because it was so, so public. Well, you think it, uh, Lex had his fingerprints on that from headquarters because the proposal was not supported by um, the counterterrorist center. Now, you'd think any proposal to go after a terrorist, you'd have the counterterrorist center in the lead saying, hey, that's a great idea. This is a bad guy. But CTC couldn't validate him as being this bad guy. And we didn't, you know, CTC didn't validate going through a, you know, a rendition, a, a covert rendition. But it was a great pet project for the chief of station. It was a very senior officer and who was very tight with Lex. They were best friends. Mm. And Lex gave his personal approval to the operation. And uh, clearly it didn't go well, as you could see. But even after that operation and after it went bad, and after the charges were filed by Interpol against the then chief of station, meaning that he was in danger of being arrested if he traveled to any country that would recognize Interpol warrant. Mm. Lex still gave him a prime chief of station job in the United States. It was the FBI that said, we won't work with him because we have to work with all of the Interpol partners. And how can we in good faith say, oh, we're with you when our chief of station in a major domestic assignment is wanted by Interpol? Wow. Incredible. Um, and th there's another uh, chapter where you talk about someone that you call Yosef um, and what he knew or didn't know about 9-11 and some lingering doubts you may or may not have about uh, what he knew or his, his involvement. Uh, can you talk about that? Uh, whatever you can talk about as far as uh, recruitment and uh, what your conversations were like and a little bit of, about some of those lingering doubts. So you said a great story, which is, which is in my book in full detail. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically he was an Al-Qaeda facilitator. And he was an Al-Qaeda facilitator who, at the time, we didn't realize, was basically on the run from the life. He didn't want that life anymore mm. because he had had a number of close calls, which is why he was a great interest to us. He had been in several locations where there either had been an Al-Qaeda terrorist attack against the United States or, or, or others, or there was an Al-Qaeda cell that had been disrupted and arrested. And Yusuf always seemed to leave just before or just after these activities but always before getting arrested, because in a couple of these countries, they wanted him at least for questioning because he was at least a known associate of these other individuals. His job as a facilitator was support, logistics, you know, that, that, that kind of business, right? So when he wound up in the country I was in, which I can't identify, um, we would get the names of certain individuals to, from our local partner service who might be of interest to us. Those involved maybe in certain uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, are, are from certain countries, certain nationalities that, you know, they just wanted to give us a chance to take a look and say, you know, are these people involved in any, you know, terrorist or extremist related organizations? Because this country had its own problem with extremism that they were trying to suppress. There was something unique about Yusuf's name, uh, not necessarily his official name and his passport, because that was a black market passport, but his uh, nickname, his kunya, which is what we call it, uh, or the Arab language, which is, you know, the name of your first child. So, you know, my first child is Steve, so I'd be Abu Steve, right? There was something unique about that, about the organization we was with. There were a couple of pieces in the puzzle that, that got my headquarters to go, there's something funny about this guy. And, and ran some exhaustive traces and thought he might be, I wasn't sure, he might be this guy who's been on the run, who's been a, an important Al-Qaeda facilitator. So... We started a, an operation to try to collect data to see if we could validate, is he that same person? And if he is, is this someone that we could approach operationally to try to recruit? Or is it someone who the FBI would be interested in, in bringing to prosecution? Well, this was um, just before 
And as I said, the agency was very concerned. We, we, we had every expectation we were going to have a major Al-Qaeda attack. We didn't know exactly where or what it was going to be. We knew they were likewise trying to hit the homeland. So we started going through efforts to disrupt, maybe throw off Al-Qaeda by wherever we saw some suspicious activity, just kind of get in the middle of it. So maybe, you know, detain people who we're suspicious of, even if we can't really see them prosecuted in either America or that country, but maybe to give Al-Qaeda reason to, to think twice about conducting their operations, thinking we may know something or know that more that, than we actually did. So based on that atmosphere, my headquarters said, you know, you've got to have the local government arrest Yusuf. And I was one, you know, we put a lot of work into this. and We're beginning to take a look at a person from what we could see indirectly, obviously, from what we could hear or know of from people in touch with him, wasn't your typical terrorist. There was something unique about him. For one, he had his family with him. Terrorists don't usually take their families with them, but he had his with him, which tells you something in the first place. We started to get an inkling that maybe, you know, he's not here necessarily to conduct an operation, but still he would know about their ops. Headquarters basically said, you know, we've got an impending threat. We've got to shake it up. And they pressured me to pressure the government to hold him. And the government told me they could only hold him for a short period of time, and then they could maybe expel him, but they couldn't extradite him anyway. And no, you know, there were no official charges, nor there were extradition treaties that this country had. So I begged for a little more time. I said, give me a little more time to try to make an approach to this guy, to try to you know, put him in a situation where I might have leverage or an advantage to at least just get him listening to me. Um, CTC at the time was not really in support of that. My division uh, chain of command, who were interesting, was Ian, who got some pretty bad hits in, in my book, including for Coast, was the one who got me basically, I think, 24 or 48 hours. So I had about 24 to 48 hours to come up with something. So we came up with this plan. I had a special team of the local partners. They were detailed to me, which means they only worked exclusively for me, but they were part of the local security service. We basically staged an arrest. Um, we had been following him. We knew where Yusuf went and when he went there. And we acquired a place that we made look like a police station, which had a prison, a little prison cell. And we had Yusuf picked up and put in jail. And uh, a lot to stew for a few hours. Uh, interviewed first by one of my, my local partner friends uh, playing the local service. And then I came in as, um, I think, Mr. David. I probably had another name, but that's just you know whatever name I would have used. And this is where, as close as we get to coercion agency, which is just trying to get our foot in the door, which is where um, I was able to, you know, basically say to you that I knew who he was. And, and one of the big dangers, and I think by professionals against uh, less professional debriefers of detainees, you never bluff. If you ever bluff and, and claim to know something that you really don't know when you're called in that bluff, then you've lost all your credibility. Part of the art to an interrogation is leading the detainee to think you already know most of the, the answers and it's in their benefit to appear cooperative mm. by talking about that, which we actually know is in Al-Qaeda's book. Mm. So that's what I did. I, I told him what his real name was. I told him what his children's names were. I told him what countries he had lived in that he had been hiding and said that you know he was in a big problem because the local government just wanted to send him to what I named a couple of countries where he would have some unfavorable treatment. But I said, you know, they're only going to just, you know, you know, well, you know what they're going to do to you. That doesn't do any good to me because it's not like, oh, I've got justice. I need to know what Al-Qaeda is going to do next. And so over the course of our conversation that night, uh, he agreed to cooperate. But again, me knowing that their tradecraft is always to agree, I arranged for a nice little resort. And it literally was a little villa where he basically had to spend a few nights with my friends, the, the partners, keeping an eye on him. And I would debrief him for hours at a time until I knew he was beginning to give really compromising information that Al Qaeda would would impart with. So you know, I just kind of lacked out that he said yes and he proved true in my short 24 to, to 48 hours. But it was an unfortunate reflection on the CIA's worry at that time of just well, how are we going to look? You know, what are going to be optics if you know we let this guy in the street and there's some sort of attack? And that became much larger after mm -hmm. nine, where it became the art of what we call the terror line. When where we would have uh, a, a subject of interest in a country, and one of our stations would come to notice them, our station obviously would want to mount an operation, ideally to recruit, because we're about intelligence. I mean, yes, it's 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 justice and, and rewards to put people away and and to have them see their their justice, but they don't save anybody's lives that way. 
They save lives if they cooperate with us. They save lives if they spy on their own organization, their own family. Mm -hmm. So that's naturally whatever CIA station wants to do. But there was a pension to just give a tear line, which is basically uh, an information report to the local government say, you've got this person in your country. He's a really bad guy. You should arrest him, which they would often do and then release him in days or weeks or what have you. And then they'd be back in business anyway. But at least there was a track record. See, I said, oh, we disrupted the operation because it was a political calculus, not an intelligence calculus that was running the day. And so do you think he knew a lot more than he let on during your, your time with him? You know, uh, the, the, the mantra is you never fully trust an agent. You never fall in love with your agent. I, I'm sure I always had lingering doubts. But I also know that Yusuf disrupted a number of operations mm -hmm. and contributed to the death, deaths of a number of his colleagues, which would not have been compatible. So Yusuf's story after the fact was, you know, he didn't know about this. Everybody knew about an aviation plot. Because it was in the 90s, we disrupted an aviation plot Jenka, by yeah. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramzi Youssef in the Philippines and, and the Far East. So he said, yeah, people talked about that, but I didn't know there was something ongoing. But he did know a number of the hijackers because he had been in guest houses with them mm. or in training facilities with them in the past, which he provided after the fact because I never mentioned their names before and he had never brought up their names. So did he know that these people were part of some secret mission? I'd like to think. He didn't, and he actually passed the polygraph exam. But still, in my core, could I have done something different? I had an Al Qaeda asset. Could anything I have done anything different that raised names like these guys to kind of provoke these names to have come up so I could have watched list of these names? I still lose sleep over that, you know, 20 years later. Yeah. And there have been a few people out there who have passed that, that poly in agency history that uh, were. Uh... <laughs> had some nefarious influences, I guess, uh, is Fair the enough, gentlest absolutely. way to put it. Uh, uh, so in your time, in, in those uh, 34 years, what did you see as far as our relationship with uh, particularly intelligence service to intelligence service when we're talking about Israel and the Mossad? It seems like a very complicated relationship because of just the things that have been in the press about them running agents against us and probably vice versa to confirm things here and there, yet they're a staunch ally. We support them, obviously, uh, in many different ways. Um, what does that relationship look like when you're when you're in the agency? And is it as uh, as complex as one would think from the outside looking in? It's probably more complex. Yeah. So from an intelligence perspective, uh, and it's actually different from the military, the uh, CIA has no allies. We have partners, right? And we have partners who cooperate with us on mutual interests but partners who also want to know what our government is doing. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're, you know, uh, brothers and sisters in arms in combat, you know, sharing fire together, which, you know, I'm sure we do at times, even with our partner services, we absolutely do. But there's always, you know, what's their agenda? And obviously Israel wants to know what the United States is doing and wants to influence what the United States is doing. So the relationship is complex because they are a very critically important partner. We have a great deal of collaboration and we have a great deal of interdependency in complementing each other's capabilities in many places, which works very well. But over the years, um, to my uh, point of view, um, Israel and Mossad has abused that. Mm -hmm. They have in the past killed our agents. Uh, Kai Bird has a great book about Robert Ames, who died in the 1983 April bombing and was uh, one of the icons and heroes of the CIA. And uh, he used to work with an individual who's now named in public, Salama, who was a member of the PLO, who was an excellent agent. And the Israelis killed him because the Israelis knew we had a positive relationship with him. Mm -hmm. Whether we had an agent relationship with Salama or with a very positive partnership, I can't say. But either way, it was something that Israel didn't like. That makes for complexities uh, in terms of, well, every operation that the Israelis run that might have a negative consequence to us be something they'll share with us? I doubt that's the case. Um, will the Israelis be there when we really call them on the map? We say, we really need your help here. Yeah, they generally will be there. So, you know, there's a great deal of interdependency, but it is very complex. Um, we probably play it a lot fairer than the Israelis do, where my colleagues will say, oh, the Israelis are always trying to pick our pocket or whatever. Uh, but it's an important relationship for both services that we each need.
And then on the uh, kind of the opposite side of that spectrum, and uh, also complex, uh, our relationship with the ISI, with Pakistan's intelligence service. Um, how does that look when you're uh, when you're a, a case officer, when you may be working there, or just you know in those in those circles? What is that relationship like, and how has that morphed over the years, particularly before and after 9/11? There's a lot less pretending there mm. in terms of Pakistan ISI's interest and concerns with CIA. Um, ISI's concern uh, was concerned with the United States looking for the Taliban and the Haqqanis and all the other groups they support. And uh, the ISI would prioritize those equities with the Haqqani Taliban network, with the Taliban, over even areas of mutual interest, such as Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State. ISI over the years got more and more aggressive in harassing our collectors, our cl- harassing our officers, officers who are often there posted to cooperate with ISI on common terrorist threats like Al-Qaeda, like like, um, um, the Islamic State. You've got to remember, Pakistan, as part of its national defense strategy, has nurtured jihadist groups as a defense against India. They're way outnumbered by India. They believe India is an existential threat. They have lost every war they have fought with India, which is why they became a nuclear power in the first place. And they believe a step short of using nuclear weapons is an ability to group uh, fund groups like Lashki Taiba, uh, Taiba, like Jashi Muhammad, all these other jihadist groups that they can use to conduct operations against the Indians. Well, after 9-11, these groups actually started evolving to be more international jihadist groups. And they started going to Afghanistan in huge numbers for training, combat experience, and integration with al-Qaeda, as well as the Taliban and the Haqqani Taliban network. So the ISI has to protect all of this because it's very damaging to them. And that's obviously one of the things we're collecting on. And they're, you know, in public, like, oh, you know, we have nothing to do with Lashki Taliban. You just tell us where the Haqqanis are. We'll go right now to find them. And we have very high confidence intel on meetings in Islamabad between ISI officials and the Haqqanis and the Taliban. We know where all the Taliban and Haqqanis live in Peshawar, in Karachi, all the major cities. We actually, in some cases, knew where they live. But it's not like we could go to the ISI and go, here's where they live, haha, because they'll just suddenly not be there when ISI has to show up. And then we would have also lost our collection capability. Because then they'll figure out, well, how did they find out they were there? Clearly, they must have had agents or technical collection or something, and they'll switch everything on and they'll root out our agents. ISI spent more time looking for our agents than they did cooperating on counterterrorism. So as opposed to Mossad, there's uh, where it is actually a collaborative relationship, that's a very adversarial relationship. And it got increasingly adversarial over the years, where it became a denied area in a lot of ways for us from a counterintelligence perspective. Denied in the sense is they're using all the tricks of the trade to kind of flesh us out, find us, get our people killed. So we have to use more extraordinary tradecraft, if you would. So that's kind of rough when you're sitting down with your ISI counterpart, as I had to on many occasions at many at different times in my career, and just hear out their airing of the grievances, something like Seinfeld's Festivus uh, <laughs> episode, right, in terms of how we've done them wrong, where I know fully well what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And, and I can't leverage them to do something about it. Yeah. Well, in the book, I love the names of the, the chapter titles, the, the headings, by the way. Was, uh, you did a great job with those. And I wanted to read one part here um, and, uh, and get your, your comments on it here. But it says, uh, my worst experience came in my final days, ironically on the heels of a rather spectacular operational success the team had been working for months to achieve. Collaborating with our local foreign partners and acting on intelligence, we had been collecting through well-placed agents and complex operations. We located a terrorist leader who at the time was our number one target. He was a senior planner close to Al-Qaeda leadership who knew the most important secrets we sought at the time, including the whereabouts of Osama bin Laden. It was a spectacular capture, but in full disclosure, the target never shared what he knew about Osama bin Laden, at least not during our brief opportunity to talk with him. He was never placed in CIA custody, and our limited contact always included a minder from the local foreign partner service. He had too much inside information concerning the questionable fidelity of our own local foreign partner, whose government refused to hand him over. Success alone came from depriving al-Qaeda of this target's contributions. It was only some years later, CIA learned that this man knew the locations for both bin Laden and Zawahiri at the time of his detention, and the identities of their caretakers. Whether or not 
He shared these secrets with our local hosts, I can't say. But I do know they released him a few years after the Abbottabad raid that killed Osama bin Laden and allowed him to disappear across the border into Iran. I mean, that was a, that, that, those two paragraphs really stood out to me. Um, so I wanted to get your thoughts on that. And then also in this same chapter called A Lifestyle, not for the squeamish or the faint of heart, you are in a, uh, in a caravan um, and you're, you're moving with a general who is targeted by a terrorist organization that had targeted you at one of your facilities with a VBIED, with a car bomb, not long before that. And it didn't go off, thank goodness. Um, but what was, uh, what can you share about those two paragraphs? And then what was it like to be in that ambush that uh, just narrowly missed you and the general? Um, well, the first part, yeah, it's a good news story and a bad news story, right? Um, we at least disrupted somebody. Uh, and in fact, we had offered that government many, many millions of dollars for him, uh, which was generally what we would do. If we would get somebody you know, wrapped up, we would you know, compensate them. And, um, and we had done that a number of times in the past. And they didn't want the money, though it was a very significant amount because this was a very significant target, mm -hmm. which should have told us something right away. That even all this this big bankroll they didn't want. So um, I mean, at the time we knew he was really important. Uh, we had worked real long and hard on him. Uh, the irony was, the local service that was involved years earlier had claimed he was one of their sources, mm. which is why they didn't want to arrest him. And we kind of had to force their hand. And one of the reasons we were successful, he was co-located at the time with a terrorist who was targeting an ethnic minority in this country, which was very politically damaging to this country. Mm. So they kind of thought they were going after the other guy and lo and behold, this guy is there as well. Wow. So it worked out really well for us that we got him off the battlefield. And I debriefed him the first couple of days before he was moved to their secure facilities. Uh, but I mean, how crushing is that to find out that what we suspected was true, that he was involved with the pipeline of facilitation to both bin Laden and to, and to Zawahiri. And all this could have ended years and years and years ago, right? That's, that's painful. Um, on the other side, they were deprived of a very capable facilitator and recruiter and financier. As for my own personal kind of <laughs> experience, yeah, I mean, um, I'm a spy. I'm not a soldier, <laughs> right? So I go where people don't see me, and and there's risk to all that, obviously. But you know, I don't fight on a battlefield, and the Marine Corps taught me to fight, and the agency taught me how to hide, and then there's some marriage between the two. But um, in an environment where I lived, where my platform was a target of multiple attacks, including the one that you mentioned that didn't go off, that would have leveled the building. So thank God it didn't, based on the size of the explosive. You take precautions. Um, and some are real simple. You change the time you leave your house. You change the route you take, right? Some simple things that we tell everybody. It's all open source. We tell our colleagues at any embassy, at any military base, just do these simple things, and you'll become a harder target, so they'll go for somebody else. So I was exhausted. I had been up for I don't know how many hours. And I had that, that, that heavy, like, fatigue feeling where even when you slept a little bit, it's like, like you're hungover almost. Mm. You just kind of like, you can't see. I'm familiar. You. Okay, there you go. <laughs> and we could talk about that offline. But, um, so I decided stupidly to take a more main road to the office. I, I was, I was in fact changing my time, but the time I was going was at rush hour, kind of a rush hour time. It was like probably around 9 a.m., which for me was sleeping in. So I was lazy. I took a shortcut, literally, uh, to get to my platform. Uh, and so I'm on this road. And um, so they would kind of like shut down the road, right, for the general. But I was already just in front of him. But I see his convoy. And I thought, son of a gun, I need to get ahead of him because otherwise I'm going to be stuck, particularly at this bridge, if they push me off the side of the road. And uh, as I say in my book, you know, we're supposed to be trained observers. And I, I hit the beginning of the bridge and I noticed a bus, which was just I never noticed a bus there. But honestly, I didn't take that bridge off. It was a main artery and one that I avoided. But I just thought it was odd. And then as I went past, and, and I honestly don't remember how many meters behind me the general's convoy was. I was not riding with it, thank God. Um, I was just wrong place at the wrong time. And then I heard the, the detonations. And, you know, my first reaction in our training is get off the X. 
Your trading is to go to the ambush, right? My trading is get the hell out of there, right? I'm a spy. So I just, you know, slammed the gas pedal. I could see, you know, smoke and hear gunfire at that point because they had had shooters in the bus with AK-47s who, when the general's convoy came up, the explosion was supposed to take out the lead vehicle, slow down the general's vehicle, and then the shooters would take out the general. And he only lived because his driver was killed. But his ADC, his aide de camp, some major who's probably a general now, reached over, grabbed the wheel, and stepped on the gas pedal and saved the general. A number of the protective detail were killed. Hmm. I was just ahead of it. And so I was probably on the crest of the bridge when he was hitting the beginning of it. And I just like made like as fast as I could to get to my platform, which is at that point locked down. Because, you know, it was very close, actually, to where my platform was. So it was, um, you know, an exhilarating experience, but uh, uh, not one that I did anything heroic about. I just, like, got out of the way after being at the wrong place at the wrong time for my own poor trade craft. But it was, uh, it was, I guess, as you guys say, danger close. So <laughs> there you go. Certainly, certainly a memory. There you go. And, uh, you know, while I have you here, I wanted to ask you about China and Russia. Um, because one, obviously they are players on the, the world stage. We have a, a history with, uh, with these, these two countries, um, and, uh, collaboration wise between those two, they have also have had a very adversarial relationship, especially in their, their border regions. And, um, what do you see as far uh, moving forward here as we, as we go into 2022, 2023 in these next 20 years, essentially, um, what do you see about, uh, as far as that relationship between China and Russia? Um, do you see them as the enemy? Do you see them as just adversarial to the United States? Um, if you had a, had a crystal ball or you're talking to your, your students at Georgetown and they ask a, a similar question or you're discussing Russia and China and their relationship with each other in the United States, um, how do you see that those relationships developing here? over the next uh, five, 10, 20 years? It's complex. And I think a lot of uh, the answer is rooted in history. And I think it's why it's really important for Americans to, to see the world from the eyes of their adversaries or their partners, if you would, because there's a lot at play. Russia and China have a history that predates you know, the Soviet Union, Russia, or even uh, contemporary China. That goes back to the time where the Russians feared the Mongolian hordes and Genghis Khan. China, likewise, the, the you know, abuse they believe they took from the European Russia over the years. That's a long history, and that's deep in the culture of both those people. And they share a border, not a terribly, terribly long one, but they're darn close to one another, mm -hmm. right? Where we're like on the other side of the world. Even in the early days of communism, clearly China and, and the Soviet Union had a huge rift that separated them, that we actually did well to manipulate and leverage ourselves to kind of try to keep that wedge between them and, and try to have a normalization of sorts with, with China at the time. So I think that's always going to be a piece of their outlook on the world. China is more of an arising power than Russia is. Russia is actually a power in decline. It's not the Soviet Union even anymore. They've lost the republics. They don't have the massive armies that they once had in the Warsaw Pact. They don't have the Warsaw Pact countries to complement them and buffer them. So. China, uh, in a lot of ways, from a security point of view, is a greater concern because of its massive power, its massive population, its economy, and its, its modernizing military. The one fortune we've had with China is China has not really aspired to be a global power. To date, at least, they want it to be the power in their neighborhood. They want to be the power in Asia. They want to call the shots there. But Russia has still continued to try to see anything, any trouble we can make for America anywhere is good for Russia because it's good to promote Russian power. And a lot of what Putin does in projecting this image of Russia as a superpower is really for domestic politics. Mm. It's really to have this image of a strong man to keep his own country in line. But he's still very much a, an old soul and looks at the long world, world, road of things as thinking, Russia should be a major power, at least in the world, and needs to get its respect. And we'll rattle our sabers at time and probably rattle a little bit more than they could deliver in order to get that respect. Russia and China will cooperate against a common threat, the United States, where they see it's in this interest. On an intelligence point of view, we see the Russians and the Chinese will share things with the Iranians, the North Koreans, and others to hurt us, right, and, and help promote and, and leverage their own relationships. So I think as we look at them, 
we at first need to better understand them so that we don't overreact in the case of Russia or underreact. And I don't mean to say we shouldn't take a strong hand. With Russia, you can't take a weak hand. You can't turn the other cheek. Russia only knows force. Russia only knows consequences. Mm. So one of my arguments where I see, oh, you know, we just need to bolster our defenses and get better on cyber, that will only go so far on that and this information. Unless Putin sees a threat, a consequence to him doing this, he'll just try to build a better mousetrap. But he's not going to give up in terms of trying to provide problems for us on the security front, in terms of meddling in our politics and threatening us or you know, trying to decouple NATO. So yeah, we've got to bolster the defenses, but with Russia, we've got to basically show them that we know what you are. You're a declining power. And here's what we could do to cause you pain. And I think for the Russians, that has a lot to do with money. Mm. I think it has a lot to do with going after the money of Putin and his allies and his cronies. I think that would be the quickest thing to get their reaction, right? So there's things we can do to do that. I think with China, uh, it's about being smart and seeing where are they in their evolution of their aspirations? Do they aspire for a more global role? Do they aspire for a role that undermines our own? China, fortunately, its economy has to keep churning out at a much higher rate than ours to please a much larger population. It's a communist state. They have some liberties, but it's still not a free press. It's not an open society. The only way to keep those people happy is giving them a quality of life. To give them that quality of life, their economy has to churn over much faster uh, than ours does. If that starts changing, if China believes that to offset that, they need to start getting a little bigger in terms of undermining what we're doing, because right now they depend on the United States as a market, right? So it'd be foolish for them to go to war with us and not to have the financial revenues that allows their economy to churn fast enough to keep pace with their population. But if those things start changing, then China's calculus might change. And China's leader, Xi, he's different than those who, uh, from who he succeeded, where they were kept playing for time. Let's get along with the United States so we can build up, we can get stronger. Xi might be at a part where, you know, we're stronger enough right now that we can go toe to toe. And that likewise would be a danger for the United States if we don't match it or at least understand it. Oh, interesting. Man, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, we're going to take it back as we finish up here to uh, to accountability, which is kind of where we started and which is uh, a lot of uh, what you talk about in in this book here. Um, but there's one uh, there's one thing I wanted to read here about accountability on page uh, 350. And uh, you say, the reality that I can share, however, is that the CIA relies on the practice of standing behind sources and methods to deflect responsibility for its mistakes. From public accounts we have all read in the press, this process is best reflected by the fact that no CIA officers were held accountable for 9-11, Iraq, enhanced interrogations, renditions gone awry, the coast bombing that killed seven of my colleagues, or our failure to identify the rise of the Islamic State before it spread across two countries and wreaked havoc in Europe. Do you see or do you, I mean, hope is, is, a, is a different thing, but uh, do you see a culture of accountability creeping back in to the agency or the military um, based largely on the events of the, uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, maybe, and people taking a more critical look at what we've been doing over the last 20 years? Uh, or is that uh, too much to hope for? So I give credit to um, General Milley, General McKenzie, and Defense Secretary Austin in acknowledging that the strike in Kabul that took place, I think on the 29th of August, was a mistake. Um, and hopefully we'll do something about it. Now, time will tell what comes out of that investigation, right? But that's certainly a, a good first step. Uh, for CIA, in my final months, in my chair, one of our most important agents uh, was killed. And we knew that there were some tradecraft problems, and there, we had been talking about tradecraft problems for a while. We wanted uh, a thorough and objective counterintelligence investigation, and the most senior officers squashed it. Well, that doesn't bode well for uh, accountability going forward. Right. But that was, you know, two years ago, right? So it's a different day. Um, and again, I, I believe in actions over words, but we'll see what the agency does. I, I think one of my concerns as the agency rebrands itself to attract the Gen Z, the millennials into the organization for what I think is still very noble, very critical work. 
is a rebranding that doesn't start with, okay, here's what your view of the CIA is. And I'll tell you, frankly, I've got a, a, a class, uh, a, 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 a graduate class, and I ask my students, they're taking intelligence courses. When you hear CIA, what's your default reaction? It's negative, mm. right? They're Gen Zs, they're millennials, they're educated, right? They're folks who want to come into the security community, right? So this rebranding shouldn't should just be, and obviously it should start with, yes, where we are a more diverse organization and God knows we need to be, right? So the actors, and they're usually actors or you know, people of color or whatever like that. But let's talk about, yeah, we do some great things and sometimes we make a mistake, but we fix ourselves afterwards. That's what I would like to see. That's what I would like to see, an acknowledgement that, you know, enhanced interrogation was wrong. I still see people defending it. And I think it's indefensible that, you know, somebody's head should have rolled for coast and didn't. That, you know, we have made some mistakes, but we will be our own worst critic. And the irony of it is, as a case officer, as an individual case officer, having individual cases, we are taught, certainly I preach because I trained in a facility, is that the case officer should be the first person to identify and address the warts, the problems with his or her case. Because if you do so, one, you build your credibility, and two, you actually exercise some control on the narrative in fixing that case. If you try to cover it up, it's eventually gonna come out anyway, and it's only gonna be a whole lot worse, make you look worse, and then somebody else is gonna manage your case for you. And yet, as an organization, our leadership is not embracing that. They should be the very first ones to say, we've got some issues here, we need to fix it, we can't just like deflect it and cover it up. But until we get out of that rag, you know, circle the wagons mentality, that's not going to change. Again, we've got essentially a pretty new leadership at CIA. I'm hopeful because I know the people that are involved, people I respect, and, and we'll just have to see if their actions merit their words or, or equal their words, I should say. And you put this book, this is, I mean, there's so much, so much in here. It's part uh, memoir, part after action, part lessons learned. Um, it, it's, it, it, it's, there's so much in here, but uh, you went through this review process and I went through it with my first three books, even though they're fiction, I just wanted to be on the safe side since I was so close to, to my time in the military. Um, but uh, you write in here, the CIA required four months to review this manuscript during the spring and summer of 2020, over the course of which I was pressured against its publication in ways both subtle and not. So what were some of those uh, ways, both subtle and not, um, that they, they went to to keep you from publishing this book? And then the, uh, the obvious question after that is then why did you um, publish it? And I think it's a very important book, for people, especially for people stepping into that world or thinking about stepping into that world precisely because of that, that accountability piece. So I appreciate you writing it. But um, uh, what were some of those subtle and non, not so subtle ways that they discouraged you from publishing this? Um, so I'll start by saying the book would have been a lot longer had they approved everything. Um, they had some significant redactions. And uh, the four months was only kind of the start of it. It was after four months I got the first review back, which they had actually canceled a couple of chapters in their entirety and made a whole lot of strikes. Then began the negotiation where I negotiated with them. And that was another, that was a course of another maybe two months, give or take, uh, of going back with alternatives. One chapter, particularly Alex and the Targeters, which I think is was very embarrassing to the agency because it, it, it highlighted how this new leadership in the agency gave a little concern for the lives of our agents uh, that made them very disposal or the importance of human and even the collectors that are out there working it. That chapter was probably about 25, 30 pages. It's now four. Mm. That's all I got out of it. But I at least was able to say something to kind of highlight it as, as an issue. Um, one good piece of news, I will have you know, Alex is no longer employed in the agency. Alex has retired. That's a good sign for me from what Mr. Burns is doing. Okay, so we'll start there. Uh, in terms of their measures, subtle or not, I can't go into a lot of detail uh, because they picked some really interesting things that could, you know, be impactful upon me. Not like physically threatening me or anything like that. Nothing like that. Uh, and and I, I would never expect that of them. Um, but to to uh, intervene with the livelihood of people in my family and myself and such like that, things that they could cause trouble with yeah. if they wanted to, as it turned out, which their lawyers would not let them do. So thus we got to publication. And, and as much of the detail that I've not been able to include in the book, 
my goal was to offer a, a world that you know most people never see in terms of espionage, which is not like the movies or Tom Cruise, you know, coming out of an airplane or like that. It's just being with someone with whom you created this intimate relationship, but not physically intimate, but intimate at a level of their souls, that they're willing to trust you with not only their lives, but often their families. And as you talk about why we keep some secret secrets, generations of their family to come. That's enormous. It's enormous the risk they'll take for people that would not be welcomed in a lot of parts of our country because of the color of their skin or their religion who have saved American lives at the risk of their own. That's amazing. And you don't just get there and you don't get there with a snap of the finger or with delivering a big bag of money or because you found somebody who's like desperate. It's a real convening of the souls, which is an art form that I think I like in, uh, to say my book, well, you may not know how tall was this person and you know, do they have a mustache and what country they're in, but you see into their soul and you see into the connection made between case officer and them that allowed them the willingness to take the risk that they took to spy for the United States. And that goes right into this, how I'd like to finish up here. Um, before I let you go, there's a memorial, two memorials at CIA headquarters. Uh, the CIA Memorial Wall is the one that uh, most people know. I write about it in my in my novels, and you eloquently describe it in uh, in your book. But there's another smaller memorial that most people do not know about that it's also close by with an inscription that reads, in honor of those who made the ultimate sacrifice in the silent struggle for freedom. What's that memorial and what does that uh, mean to you? Ironic that it's very small. It's about, you know, 12 by 12, maybe. And it's after the turnstiles. So you have to um, check in to the building because the the, the, uh, the atrium, which is where the Wall of Stars is located that you're speaking of, and the statue of General Donovan and, and the big seal everybody sees on TV, that's the, the main entryway into the agency. It's just past the badge machine to get in. And I would tell you probably 98% of the agency workforce doesn't even know it's there. Wow. Because it's not, at least in the last 20 years, been really made part of their culture. One of the disappointments I have had in the agency, and especially being a former Marine and, and you're a former SEAL, is, is that esprit de corps. I mean, that cockiness, that arrogance for being part of this elite group. The agency at times have tried to like push that out of its service as opposed to embrace it. And I think connecting with our history, which is what we did, you're kind of circling back to your earlier conversation about the long paramilitary course we took and the interrogation and jumping out of airplanes. We should be embracing this as we brand ourselves to the Gen Z and the millennials. Serve your country, serve it nobly with, yes, let me say it, an elite service that does tremendous things for the American public. That's what I'd like to see the CIA embrace. And that starts with its agents. It's an espionage service. And an espionage service functions based on the life of its agents and then those who handle them. Amazing. Well, I want to thank you for your, your time today, your, your 34 years at the agency, your time in the Marine Corps before that, for passing on these lessons. I'm sure your students are very lucky to have you at, uh, at Georgetown, imparting some of this wisdom onto them as they start their journeys into the, uh, the world of intelligence, wherever they, they may go. And uh, for everybody else, The Recruiter, it is out there now, everywhere books are sold, and people can follow you on Twitter as well. Right. And that's, uh, there's a five after that, right? There's a yes, there is. Douglas on in five. There you are. Yeah, there must be four others. So. Okay. So you are there and, uh, and thank you so much for, uh, for taking all this time today. I really appreciate you doing that. And uh, I learned a lot from this book. I'm sure there are going to be things that I take from this and apply into my, into my novels. And I'll, I'll talk about that in the acknowledgements for sure, because I love to, uh, to get people out there reading with so many distractions that are out there today. That's, uh, one of the things that I try to talk about as much as I possibly can is putting the requisite time, energy, and effort into the study of history and to a certain problem set or issue before you spout off about it on social media channels and uh, make things more divisive. So thank you so much for, for writing this. And uh, once again, thank you for all you've done for the nation. Thank you so much for having me on the program, but also the conversation. I think it was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast. So the guys at Premier Body Armor, they heard that I got the new Microsoft Surface. So Microsoft, thank you so much for sending this. This is where I'm going to finish my next novel in the blood, which comes out in May of 2020.
22. So they saw that I got this and they thought that I cannot use my old laptop case for the new Microsoft Surface. So they sent along, look at this, a ballistic Premier body armor laptop case. So this has inserts inside level 3A. And uh, I think that is 9 mil, 357 Magnum, 357 SIG, and 44 Magnum. So um, I think a 12 gauge is in there too. So right here, check that out. Check them out on their website, Premier Body Armor. Go check them out. And uh, this case is awesome. Level 3A, this will be uh, the case that I use to hold my laptop to finish in the blood. So Premier Body Armor, thanks guys. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Six Hour. You can find Douglas London's book, The Recruiter, everywhere books are sold. And you can follow him on Twitter at Douglas London 5. You can find me at officialjackcar.com. You can go to Jack Car USA for the merch and you can pre-order In the Blood, which is coming out in May of 2022. That's the next novel in the James Reese series. If you like this conversation, Please leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. And until the next time, take care, stay safe, keep fighting. And a special thank you to Schnee's. I've been using Schnee's boots for over a decade now. As you can tell, for these ones right here, it's just one of my favorites. These are the granites. I think every hunter should have a pair of these in their quiver. But these guys right here, uh, these are the ones that I wear when I'm going into the backcountry and hope to come out heavier than when I went in. So uh, right here, Granite's awesome boot. Absolutely love these. You can see these have been worn quite a bit. These are some of my other favorites right here. So these are the Hunter 2s. These are, I would wear these all day, every day if I, if I could, but uh, um, amazing boot. Love everything they have going on over there at Schnee's. So be sure to check them out. I have some new boots now. I think I have uh, 10 pair right now. My wife has a pair. Uh, and then I just got a couple new pairs. And right here, these are the Beartooth. I've wanted these for a while. So super excited about trying out the Beartooths. That'll happen this summer and fall. And then the Kestrels right here. So those are a couple new pairs that I have in the arsenal that I'm looking forward to checking out here soon. So if you haven't heard of Schnee's, check them out online, check out their story, check out their Instagram, the boots they make in an Italian boot factory. So those are handmade in Italy. The only place you can get them is through Schnee's directly to you. So you're getting more boot for your money and uh, every part of these things. Uh, you can just tell how much care and how much time, energy, and effort goes into these boots right here. And what's also great about Schnee's is that you can go visit them in Bozeman, or you can give them a call and tell them about uh, where you're going to hunt, what you're doing, and uh, they can make some recommendations for you right there on the phone. So Schnee's, thank you so much. And I'm going to read this part because you get 10% off. Uh, so I don't want to mess this part up. When you shop at Schnee's, and that is S C H N E E S dot com, make sure you use the promo code Jack21, J A C K 2 1. When you do, you'll save 10% off your pair of Schnee's boots and logo wear. These handmade hunting boots usually sell out fast, so grab your pair today. Take care of your feet. Don't compromise. Upgrade to Schnee's. Again, that's Schnee's, S C H N E E S dot com and promo code Jack 21.